Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Maven Capital Partners podcast, Invested. My name is Laura Boyd and I'm an entertainment reporter and presenter and I've interviewed everyone from Harrison Ford to Rod Stewart. But this podcast is a little bit different. Here I'm speaking to some CEOs and entrepreneurs behind some of the UK's fastest growing companies. I hear about what makes them tick, how they got to where they are today, the highs and lows of their business, and get their top tips for anyone looking to follow in their footsteps. Now, in today's episode, I'm chatting to the CEO of company Surmise, Tom Dunlop, to hear how he knew his business was in with a sporting chance of success. Tom, lovely to meet you. And you, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Now we're going to go straight in. We always start this podcast by finding out how you kick off your day. So tell me about how Tom Dunlop gets up in the morning, what you do to get your day off to the perfect start. Well, I guess it's uh, it's probably changed over the years given the uh, arrival of kids. Um, so I guess <laughs> at, the, at the minute we've got a, we've welcomed our third child actually not too long ago. Um, oh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess if I'm not woken up by the kids, I'm usually up at about 6 a.m. ish. Um, and to be honest, probably what I first do before I, I guess interact with the kids is try and check what I've got going on that day. I have a quick check on my calendar. Um, obviously, we've got a US presence. So if there's anything that's happened overnight that I need to be aware of, I kind of get my mind sort of focused and just I, I need to deal with that almost anxiety of, of checking my phone and understanding what the, the day's got ahead. But then I'll yeah. put my phone down and very much, you know, focus on the kids. I really try and give them all my attention um, and, and and basically help get ready for school. I always make sure I have breakfast with them um, before either dropping them off or, or then going into the office. So it's not a particularly exciting uh, morning routine. It probably was a lot more active prior to having a number of kids. But uh, <laughs> But that's kind of how I wake up at the start of the day. It's something that actually, like, cause we've done quite a lot of these now and everyone with kids is the same in business it seems like that those kind of couple of hours as manic as they are are quite key for getting that time in I mean I know that myself it's just it's mad time but it's actually quite <laughs> special to have and it, yeah it's quite quite a good way to start the day and make sure that you you get to see them as well now we're going to come on to because you're a CEO of some eyes um yep. so we're going to come on to that but first of all I want to know a bit about you and and your background so where did you grow up and what were you like at school I uh, grew up in the well, the northwest, in particular, a place called Berry. Uh, I still actually live uh, there today, even though I never thought I would. Um, and I think me as a, a child, I think to be honest, my life re- revolved around sport. Um, so I wasn't the kind of, I guess, tech founder that was playing with computers or you know was always knew I'd be kind of going into tech. If anything, I was the the opposite. I was very active. I used to play a number of sports. Um, I then kind of focused in on uh, badminton actually as as kind of my 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 main area and played for Great Britain and very much was trying to go to the Olympics. Um, and it was it was quite a, a kind of I always found and this probably still rings true today that I always had to have so much going on like I couldn't just settle with doing whether it was just like education I got you know straight A's I was doing the law as a, as a kind of a law degree um, but I always had to have the kind of Great Britain badminton alongside. Um, and it was at that kind of pivotal point, really, in my career when I guess I got to that university age um, where the badminton was kind of, I knew I had to make a decision. Either I was a full time professional, but I had to really commit and probably move down to Milton Keynes, for example, or I had to make a sidestep and, and, and move away from, from badminton. And when I did that and kind of went into the, the, the work world, um, it was very much then looking for that kind of, I guess, side hustle, as it were, that kind of really where the entrepreneurial journey started, I guess. Um, but yeah, as a as a kid and growing up, it was it was all about sport. I mean, you, well, I guess you must have been. Were you really disciplined with that? Because I take it, I mean, things like that kind of you know take over your life, don't they? You're you're, I guess, because I I sang as a little girl, and I was kind of you know after school while my friends were out, I was away at choirs and concerts and things. It's, it's kind of a different type of life, isn't it? But I was always so driven because I knew, like, you know, I was excited for the kind of next thing and felt that I always had to be the best. Did you have that in you? Oh, massively. I mean, I think, not, not to a detriment, I think it was one of those where every weekend I was away, probably in a different country somewhere, playing 
the badminton at, at a tournament. Um, and on three of the days of the week, I was training at 5 a.m. Um, before like college, before school. So I used to try and find, because, you know, I couldn't jeopardize school. Um, I had to find other ways to train. I was determined to always be number one. So at the point when I became, I guess, European champion and um, it was kind of, well, how can I maintain this? And some of the, um, I guess, the the people I was competing against after school didn't go to college. They were kind of going full time at that point. So I was very conscious of the fact of, well, I'm I'm probably going to lose ground here if I if I don't find other ways to to keep up. So it was, it had to be very disciplined. You had to find time. Any any spare time, as it were, was I was always trying to to, to pack that with some form of improvement in my kind of sporting world. Um, and yeah, you did, did miss out, but I think it was you know when I look back now, the the, the experience of traveling around the world and being a team England, and I guess the life lessons and ultimately what's carried forward for business as well of, of being part of that kind of great brain environment was was hugely rewarding um, and I wouldn't have changed it for the world. What have you taken from that into the business world then? Um, well, I think that that sort of discipline and is, is definitely one thing. I think one of the things that I didn't necessarily call it that at the time and um, probably our biggest value, and everyone talks about this now, it's very fashionable to talk about 1% of so marginal gains and that kind of mindset. I didn't call it that back when I was training, but my mentality was always, like we're all a similar level, me and the, you know, the number two and number three in Europe, we're always very much technically very similar. Um, so I always had to try and find just that, what, how can I beat them in any other aspects? How can I be mentally more strong than than, than they are? So the reason I used to train at 4.35 a.m. Um, was because I knew they weren't. And, you know, it became fashionable. You hear a lot of athletes talk about running on Christmas Day. So I did that. Um, but then that wasn't really enough because everyone said they did that. So you're always just trying to find what what can I do that they don't do? And then when you step on that court, you just feel more prepared. You feel more superior and you're kind of, you know that you've done more than they have. So mentally you're in a better place. And I think coming into the business world, what I try and really instill as the culture is, look, we're against, you know, some big US competitors, for example, that have raised a lot of money, but they will not be obsessing over every detail. They won't be looking at every single bit of what we do and trying to improve it. And we always have that mentality of, I guess, how can we do something, anything on a day-to-day -day basis that just brings us that step forward? And it's kind of yeah. an obsession on this constantly moving forward that um, is really come from that kind of sporting background. Yeah, I completely understand. And that feeling of even if it is just a psychological thing that you know you have done, gone above and beyond and done all that you can, you're as prepared as you can be that there is, you know, it's so, so helpful. So you go to study law and then how does the, the business kind of come into that then? Yeah, so I'd say I've done a few pivots in my uh, in my life. So I, I guess I started off doing, um, I guess, sports agency, kind of representing whether it be footballers and Olympic athletes. I thought it was a great hybrid between law and sport. So I thought this could be perfect for me. Um, but actually what I found was when I did just, just like, I guess, worked in a law firm, the I, I really liked the, just the, I guess, the problem solving side of law, um, but applying it to a business situation. So I really kind of focused in on that and became an in-house lawyer quite quick. Um, it was around that time that I think when I stopped doing as much sport, I actually, I don't know why, I just, I just had a natural sort of interest in technology. And at the time, I, I started a comparison site for solicitors. That was my thing when I was in law school. Um, and it was more at the time, it was just to prove that I could do a business because I couldn't get a training contract, which was you know really hard to come by. I didn't have any lawyers in my family, so my, I had to kind of convince people that you know i even though i've got a sports background i'd make a good lawyer and they they, they, t they tend to my personality probably wasn't the traditional lawyer um personality so i think um i had to kind of prove in other ways which is why i did a tech business but that kind of opened my eyes up to this whole new world that i probably hadn't kind of seen before of the software world and and how tech was really i guess expanding year on year so when i looked to go in house i found a a role for a very high growth software company one called AppSense um, that seemed to be perfect I was still quite junior in terms of my um, I guess post qualification experience um, but as soon as I got into that business um, I kind of caught the bug because you're surrounded by you know very entrepreneurial people and um, the founder of that business is, is very much involved with Samize today um, and was one of our early investors and I think just really kind of I, I kind of caught the bug a little bit from from working in that environment 
Um, and I kind of always knew at that point, I was kind of always had a little black book of ideas. I was trying to think about what could I do. Um, and it, it was crazy that I guess you don't really focus on what problems you have as an individual. You try and think of these kind of huge things that, that, that might apply to everyone else. And you think almost yeah. a problem that you have is quite boring at the time. Um, and that's really, it was it was actually a friend of mine that I said, you know, I've been, we went through an acquisition and AppSense got bought. Um, so we scaled that one and it sold for around 200 million-ish. Um, and we basically, at the time, I reviewed about 500 contracts as part of the sale. Um, and it was completely manual. I had to re review every single oh line. God. It was printing them off at a highlighter. And I'm working in a high-tech business. And I'm sat there looking at everyone else with their tech. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? This is like yeah. a crazy waste of my law school and all that time. Um, so it was then I suppose my co-founder, who's one of the software engineers, and just said, look, I know what I'm looking for. At the moment, I've got a highlighter and paper. Like, surely there's a better way of doing it. Um, and that's when we started to kind of trade ideas about like basically the first concept was how do we summarize a contract? How can we summarize a, a long contract into the key points? Um, hence the name. Um, so we started with a really, really hard problem, which was probably today's standards in good stead, but we started with a really, really hard problem. Um, and it was quite interesting as I, as my career progressed, I worked for other software businesses. The last one was um, a company called UserZoom, very much Silicon Valley based. Um, they sold for 800 million, which is, you know, a huge exit. Um, but I think in that time, I noticed the sort of pre-signature phase, which was I had very demanding salespeople constantly chasing me up saying, you know, I need a contract today. I need it reviewed today. And it was that kind of, how do you get a contract created and reviewed in a, in a, a much more efficient way? So I guess feeling that pain across the full like contract life cycle, as it were, from the creation through to managing and sign contracts really spurred me to, you know, I guess do something about it and and try and yeah. create something. And so you saw a gap in the market. How do you take that step then from having the idea to actually putting that into into action? I think it's um I think a lot of people think of, I guess, founders or, you know, quitting the job, uh, like working with no salary and trying to graft into this. I mean, for my for me, it wasn't um, as, as kind of black and white as that. So I was working with Dave essentially outside of working hours. We were trying to come up with a, an MVP, a, a, a kind of version of the products that I could actually show people and demo people. Um, and obviously I had a good network of lawyers and general counsels. So I went to them with my really, really rough MVP and said, look, this is what it does. Would you be interested in it? got some people to sign basically a trial agreement. It cost them nothing, but it was just, a, I guess, for me, it's proving that I had people who bought into the concept and would buy it and would pay money for it. Um, and once we had that, it was actually going to, to Maven really on uh, early on in our um, journey and say, look, we want to build this thing. There's clearly a gap in the market. I think everyone can relate to, um, but we do need some capital because, you know, you've got to pay expensive developers. You've got to, kind of get to a point where it's not a really rushed MVP product. It's got to work. Um, and that's when we went to Maven and got some um, pre-seed investment. Um, and at that point, it allowed us to actually go full-time on uh, on the business and really kind of create the products and start selling it. And I'll say the rest is history, but we may go on to that. But um, that's how it kind of started into the leap. It wasn't as black and white. I was kind of doing it on the side until I got that MVP proved out. <laughs> What kind of impact did that all have on your your life, your social life and, you know, your kind of family life at that stage? Because I guess, you know, you're working, but you're kind of working on this massive idea on the side, like time management. How did you handle that? I think it kind of goes back to what I was like as a, as a kid, if I'm honest with you, it's kind of always having to balance a lot of commitments. Um, there was a period of time when I worked as just, a, I say just a lawyer, but I was, I was a lawyer in house and I didn't really have the idea. I didn't, I wasn't working anything else. And I, it, it was her, like, I didn't enjoy it at all. I couldn't sit there at night just watching TV and not thinking about, you know, something else. Um, so for me, it was hugely rewarding because I always had this exciting kind of, uh, idea that I could go and work on in the evenings and weekends um, but then in the day I was actually working for a high growth company and I was like taking in, speaking to all the departments, really understanding how the machine works. And, and that was huge helpful. I mean, now as we're scaling up, those learnings have, have massively impacted how we run the business. Um, yeah. so it was, it, I just felt like every day was like a, a school day. I was learning so much from this other company and then trying to apply it to, um, you know, the exciting idea that could one day be a company I could run. So, um, 
yeah, it wasn't, I didn't see it as an issue. Although when you look back now, um, yes, it was extremely hectic, um, particularly as we started having kids around that time and uh, yeah. as, as well. But it's uh, it was all fun and games. Yeah, I enjoyed it. How do you balance that being so, so busy and that family life? Are, are you able to switch off or are you just very, very good at juggling? I think what I found with um, with kids, to be fair, is they force you to switch off because they demand your attention. And and actually that balance really helped me, I think, because if I if I didn't have that, I don't think I could switch off. I think I'd always be kind of plugged in, whereas, um, you know, I, I know I always made it a point, w- whichever kind of stage of the, the company and even pre-starting that I'd be there for breakfast and always get there home before they go to bed and and see them and and that for me was my it's not downtime as such but it's certainly a different um focus for me mentally I can't sit there and think about work I'm forced to focus on the kids um and that break actually is really important yeah they're so. good at uh, bringing you back to reality aren't they <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you have to have to switch off for the for them what do you yeah. think um your friends and family how do you think they would describe you um I think they describe me I mean, ultimately definitely driven definitely you know I guess someone who uh won't just sit there and and kind of plod with something he's always got something on and always always driving towards something so definitely that kind of just um innate drive um I think a lot of people hopefully would would also think I'm pretty kind of relatable I've always I've ne- I'm never kind of too busy for um for people um and so just and, and not to really talk about work all the time I'm, I I do like to kind of just be there for people and just generally have a, a a normal conversation and and talk about kids and talk about things that, that help me actually switch off from from the day to day um yeah. so I, I I think yeah main, mainly just driven and this sort of you know a lot of people say this now like, oh, I always knew you'd you know you'd do something um uh, like this or something crazy or something and, and I think it's because probably they knew me when I was doing the sport alongside education so they always knew there was something going to happen um yeah. and and that's probably how they describe me I'd say there's this thought that you must go to London London's the epicenter you know it's the financial you know kind of center of the UK but you're very much kind of stayed within or grounded in Manchester certainly how important was that to you is is massively important. I think the one thing I realised with um, working for Silicon Valley business, actually, even more so than than London, was the reason Silicon Valley got so prominent in the tech industry was because when they scaled one business that that grew to a certain size and it exited, all the people that went on that journey then created new companies, and then they'd scale, and then they'd exit, and then they create another one, and they fostered this ecosystem of uh, like really. As long as you've got a few of those early companies that make it, the people that go on that journey are bound to then probably make the the, the next you know big company from from that area. Um, so it's so important that you know you do stay in a certain area, particularly if you're passionate about the area. Like I'm very passionate about Manchester and the Greater Manchester area. So, you know, for me, it was it was never a question of moving away from Manchester. It was more just making sure and really trying to. Um, you know, I brought together the people I work with at, at Absence. Um, there's another company called Avecto that um, kind of spun out from Absence. Um, and it, it, from that one company and and how how many people have guess, gone on to create their own companies, um, there's there's quite a few. And we've hired the management team all from those companies. And then when when we exit at some point, um, you know, we'll probably do another one. So will someone else. And and we'll start to really foster this ecosystem of. Um, of tech growth and the people that have been there and done it and it's it's so important that that's how you create an ecosystem it's not necessarily mm-hmm. just availability of capital it's or training people through universities it's actually having people who've been there and done it before and actually keeping those companies in the sort of Manchester area yeah well I think it is really really important it's really great to hear that be really inspiring for a lot of people as well and um, tell me where Samize is at just now we are kind of post series a i guess as a stage central manchester we've got an office uniquely called the treehouse actually has a treehouse inside um wow and the, i know yes yeah, very tech isn't it we didn't put it in there it was already in there um i know we've just expanded to, to the us um well kind of nine months ago um and we've opened up an office in boston uh, again very similar culture to manchester it feels a, a little bit of that kind of manchester b mentality and um, that was against the world sort of uh, culture. So we've we've gone there. 
Um, we've been growing more than 100% year on year since inception. So we're, we're continuing kind of that high growth trajectory. And um, I think more than that, what I would say about where we're today is, you know, culture wise, I think we've got a really strong culture. We have values that we call grow. So it's G-R-O-W um, for growth mindset, respect to others, one team and will to win. It's still so powerful how people have really got behind not only the idea, but are massively passionate about these same, I guess, underlying values that we wanted to to start the business with. Um, I think when you when you found a business, it's all about the idea and there's you and one other person or you and your own and you're so obsessed with the idea and nothing else and you yeah. don't probably realize how rewarding it is actually seeing so many people you bring on that journey and how they get equally as passionate as you do about the same thing, you know, contracts of all things. And you've got people probably more passionate than me about, you know, making contracts more efficient in the business. And it's um, that's that's probably the most rewarding thing about where we are today. Yeah, it must be really exciting to see. And what was the best bit of advice you ever had, either in business or or sport? What's the best bit of advice that's kind of stuck with you? I think probably one that I didn't realize at the time. Um, this is actually a, a, a saying that was from. I mean, it's, it's very mainstream, but Reid Hoffman said a, a a kind of piece of advice which was um, do things that don't scale. Basically, and at the time, it sounds a bit counterintuitive, but one thing I've noticed is you're always in a phase. And those phases can last three months, six months, 12 months. Um, but you really need to act in accordance with the phase that you're in. So when we started, I would demo, I'd sell, I'd be customer service, I'd be everything um, to the business, which is fine because we just had to prove the concepts. And then as you're going through those different milestones and different phases of growth, it's really important to understand where you are and where I guess you should be, what should be scaling at this point, what shouldn't. Um, and that was something that, really resonates um, with me now that I know that in two years time with the shape and feel of the business will be very different to today but that's good that's what you want because you're you're in a different phase of the business I think some people are reluctant to change and want to and assume that the same things will continue to apply no matter where you are um, so that was a, a huge piece of advice that that really stuck with me and is, is um, something that I live by. It's, it's served you well um, as someone who is so driven and so successful have there been setbacks and failures along the way and how have you dealt with them? Yeah, I think I think that has um all the time. I think there's, there's these weird moments in life where um it's almost like the butterfly effects where that the, the effects that they have on, on you as an individual. I remember playing badminton for Great Britain and we were in Poland of all places and we were like in some kind of remote um I guess village that was about an hour away from from Warsaw I just I don't know why this really sticks with me but um and I was only about 17 18 at the time and we were there with our posh England track suits all latest gear and I think I was a bit annoyed because I'd lost or something I don't know um and I walked through this marketplace and you just saw around you this kind of feeling of like these these there's real poverty there if I'm, if I'm honest and you're kind of sat there walking through and everyone's looking at you like almost like you're an alien walking through with um you know these these the kind of all all these kind of like the latest equipment the gear and all the gear yeah no idea as well but the um <laughs> what, what I found was that that had a really profound impact on me actually I'd like after that I had this sort of perspective that was look setbacks in the grand scheme of things um almost like I welcome them at this point because one thing if I've known from scaling is if you're not really pushing the boundaries or you're not trying to grow exponentially or you're not trying to innovate ahead of your competition and um, everything can just seem a little bit kind of flat if you ever feel like I've, if i ever feel that it's a bit going going well and everything's okay and there's no problems um it makes me a bit anxious now i'm i'm like well that must mean we're not pushing the boundaries enough or yeah. we're not kind of trying to innovate faster than the competition and it, it actually the, the weird thing is no setbacks sort of causes me now more anxiety than if I do, if I have a problem to solve. So I think my mentality has changed quite a lot with how I deal with it. Um, and actually now very much, um, I, I don't, I don't love setbacks. That's a weird thing to say, but I would expect it. And if there isn't any, um, that will probably cause me more anxiety than, uh, than not having them. Yeah. Not getting too comfortable. Yeah. hundred percent. Definitely. <laughs> Um, finally, Tom, it's been so interesting to chat to you, but what would be your three kind of top tips or bits of advice for people to looking, who are looking to start a business or are looking to grow their business? What are the kind of three best things you could say to them? It's always a difficult one, the spinning phase, but I think, I think let's say, I mean, if you started a business, I think the, the, 
biggest piece of advice I'd say is always look for a pain that you have actually suffered, something you've genuinely felt. I think it sounds, I think a lot of people focus on other people's pain or mm. something they think is quite desirable. What you probably find is you're the expert in something that you've experienced and you probably don't know it, but actually it's so important that you've felt that pain to go on this journey because it's hard. I mean, it's hard to start a business and scale it. And you've got to be so passionate that when you're faced with these setbacks, um, you can overcome them because you you what genuinely want to find a solution. So I think you start a business, that's absolutely key. Um, as you start to go through the scaling journey, it's kind of, as I said before, recognize the phase you're in. Um, you know, don't worry about pulling every metric under the sun because you've seen it, you've heard it on some podcasts that it's good to do that. If you're just trying to get to, you know, 100K revenue or half a million revenue, like just do what you need to do. Just be scrappy and don't worry about how it scales and, and all the metrics, for example. So recognize what focus, uh, what phase you're in. And then probably the final piece, because um, you see this uh, a lot online about, you know, unicorns and, you know, I guess talking about being a billion dollar business and, and not really understanding how you're going to get there. So I think the biggest thing for me is just focus on the milestones, not that ultimate unicorn uh, status and raise accordingly. Cause we, I think have been quite conservative with how we've raised money. Um, you know, we've got good valuations, but we've not pushed it to certainly what competitors have done. Um, I yeah. think valuations and investment can be a bit of a vanity metric sometimes for businesses um, without kind of any sort of bearing about well, where, where does this take us and why, why are we even raising money and, and where does this take us? And then what will we do at that point? Um, so always works to milestones, not just to be a unicorn of some description in the future. Amazing. Um, well, listen, Samai's are doing fantastically at the moment. Long may it continue. And um, do you still find time for the badminton? I don't. I don't. I, uh, yeah, completely. <laughs> I've not played for about 10 years, probably. Oh, my um, goodness. Yeah. It's a weird one. I think one of those where you were... Uh, it would frustrate me playing because I used to play at a level. I couldn't play it socially. It would, uh, I, I just wouldn't enjoy it. Finally, actually, where do you see the business going? What's the kind of, what's the kind of plan so far? I think, I mean, if I'm honest, our next milestone, we have a, a pretty clear, um, I guess, revenue where we want to get to over the next few years. We're on what we call the scale up journey. Um, so it, it was between that one to 10 million ARR. So that was, we, we recognized that as a quite recognized phase. Um, certainly growth in the US. So we definitely want the US to account for probably at least 50% of our revenue um, mm -hmm. over the next couple of years. Um, but I think for me personally, there's a, there's a huge focus on just being the disruptor in the industry. Like we do things very differently to competitors. And I think we lead the way on on how we innovate in this market. And obviously I'm very passionate about um, the problem as in I dealt with contracts. So, um, you know, I love the product side of the business and really trying to understand how we produce that next innovative feature um, and then coming back to what we said before, um, I'm very passionate about, I guess, the Manchester ecosystem, making sure that, um, I guess, Manchester's put on the map as being a real tech hub, that the companies that start to get fostered here actually scale up and then they can reinvest. And I guess the people that go on that journey will be the next entrepreneurs. So um, all those three things are really a, a kind of personal goals to uh, to do for me. Well, I'm sure you'll get there. Um, and listen, it's been brilliant to hear from you. And I know that people are going to take a lot from this. So thank you so much. We'll let you get on with your busy day. But lovely to chat to you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Well, it was brilliant to hear from Tom there. Thank you so much for joining us, Tom. And thank you to you too for watching or listening. Don't forget to hit like or subscribe to the podcast. And for more information, you can check out mavencp.com. I'll see you soon.